you. I believe that the Lord can do something today, something that you and I couldn't have produced in the other 364 days that we've had. Amen. The Lord could heal and restore and bring back and give you a thousand times over everything that you've lost today than this year. Amen. That's what the Lord has the ability to do. So I'm believing for a better year next year than the one that I've had before. And I want to talk to you about something this morning in the short time that we have. Something that has the ability to completely change your life. The practice that I want to speak on today on the last Sunday of the month has the ability to equip and empower you to go through the hardest of seasons and the hardest of times. 2024, uh, we don't know what the year holds. Uh, you, you can agree. We got elections coming up and that's enough uh, to say that we don't know what this year could potentially Hold. There might be hard seasons. There might be uncertainties. It might be times where you're sitting there confused and afraid. It might be times for some of us when we get a diagnosis and we're not sure what to do about it. Sometimes you're sitting there and the Satan's screaming into your ear, what will you do? But I believe today, as I'm going to be sharing about this vital practice for your life, that it will set you up and set me up. For a life of victory and not the life that crumbles down every time you face something that's bigger than you. Amen. What do you do when you don't know what to do? That's the question that I want to ask on this last Sunday of the year. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Now let me ask the second question. Who do you go to when you don't know what to do? Would you open up with me to the book of 2 Chronicles, and I will read a lengthy passage, uh, chapter 20. 2 Chronicles, chapter 20, and I'll read verses 1 through 13, and I hope you can pay attention. This is what the Word of the Lord says. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, and with them some of the Munites, came against Jehoshaphat for the battle. Some man came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Eden and from Edom and from beyond the sea. And behold, there in Hazan Tamar, that is in Gedi, then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord. He proclaims a fast throughout all Judah. As you know, we are proclaiming the fast throughout all City Hill on the second week of January. And we'll have services every single day of that week besides Wednesday and Saturday. So I am excited for you and I. And Judah and City Hill assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Verse 5. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem and in the house of the Lord before the new court and said... O oh Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? And they have lived in it and have built for you, Lord, in, a, in it, a sanctuary for your name, saying, if a disaster comes upon a sword, judgment, pestilence, famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house. And cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. Now behold, the man of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy. Behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit, O our God. Will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I thank you for the ability to preach your word. Father, I thank you for the ability, Lord, to be in your sanctuary. I thank you, God, for the privilege of being called your sons and your daughters. Lord, there are times and there are seasons when we don't know what to do, but our prayer is that our eyes will always be on you, Lord. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, 
I want to talk about something that is vital to your Christian walk. It is absolutely needed for your fatherhood and your motherhood. Something that you cannot necessarily just practice occasionally. No, you got to practice this regularly. I'm here with a divine call this morning because I believe, I still believe, in the power of the living God to change, to rewire, to turn 180 degrees and do what only He can do in your life. Do I have still anybody that is believing for a better 2024 than they had 2023? Come on, church. God has the ability. I'm here to talk about prayer. 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 It's a vital, important component to your spiritual walk here. Notice, I didn't say thinking about prayer. A lot of us do a lot of thinking about prayer and very little praying. If what would happen in your life if Finally, you made a decision that every time you just wanted to think about it, you would actually pray about it. Imagine how much time, instead of thinking about my problems and thinking about my job and thinking about my family and thinking about my prayer, prayer, marriage, I would actually start praying about these things and laying them at the... See, it's not enough to just hear sermons about prayer. You can't just podcast your way into heaven. You can't just listen to somebody else talk about praying. I'm actually talking about that you and I have to be a man and a woman and a son and a daughter that is marked by prayer. You remember this season I've been talking a lot about non-negotiables. Well, prayer is a non-negotiable for your and my life. It's not something that you could choose to do, spend some time. No, no, it's not something you do once a month. No, prayer is vital for you and I all the time. The unfortunate thing that you and I do sometimes is we do prayer when we find ourselves in some unfortunate situations. And so we go to God only when we have some emergencies in our life. That does not sound like a relationship that Jesus bought for you on that cross. That does not sound like the life that he wants you and I to live that he purchased on the cross. Listen, here's what you find so interesting in the Bible is that disciples witnessed the manifestation of the Father through his Son walking, healing, loving, turning around, walking on water, multiplying food, but somehow, some way, didn't ask to learn how to cast out devils. Didn't ask on how to multiply food or perform a miracle. What did they ask him? Teach us how to pray. What did they understand that sometimes you and I don't? Listen, what they understood, it's not about me learning how to heal. It's not about me learning how to cast out devils. It's about me connecting to the source that casts out devils, to the source that provides when there is no provision. It's me connecting to the source. And the way that you and I do that is we do that through prayer. And what's interesting is that what I discover in my little pastoral walk is that people think that they can pray however they want to pray. But when you look into the Bible, you find out that God actually gives us patterns to pray. Now, I'm not talking about this morning about prayer over your food. I'm talking about prayer that produces powerful result in your life. There's models that have been laid out for us in these scriptures. Matter of fact, Paul puts it this way in Corinthians. He says, these things are written for your example to show you how to do it. Did you know that the Bible has not just been written for you to just explore things. It's written for you to experience things in your life. It wasn't written so that you can just get it, uh, look at it and be encouraged about the people that experience God. No, it's God saying to you that you can experience me the same way they experienced me. I can do the same thing in your life that I have done in their life. And what I see in this story that I've just read to you about the man named Jehoshaphat is that he is no different from you and I. He has the same heart, the same blood, the same vision, the same eyes, the same person just like you and I. But he is a person of prayer and not just a regular prayer, but a prayer that produced a powerful result. Jehoshaphat, 35 years old, finds himself in a very unfortunate situation. The Moabites, the Ammonites are all coming against him. And here is why 
I absolutely love this story. I love this story. I love the Word of God because it does not hide anything. You see, I'm so glad that you and I didn't write this book. I'm afraid that if you and I wrote this book, it would be much of like the Instagram is of today. It would be a book of highlights. But see why I, I don't know about you, but why I relate to this book is not just because of the heroes and the sheroes. Why I relate most of the time to this book because I see there are people with some failures, with some fears, with some uncertainties. People that didn't know what to do, but God still stepped in onto the scene and did what only God could do. That's why I can so relate to this book because I understand that I don't need to hide my emotion from God. I can experience my emotion to God because God is unwilling to deal with anything that you're unwilling to expose. God does not deal with who you pretend to be. He only deals with who you actually are. There's no playing games. There's no playing tricks with God. Comes a moment, a knock on the door, Jehoshaphat, Something is going on. What's going on? Well, the armies are coming against you and it is something bigger than you. The dust is in the air. The army is within sight. What are you going to do? The king. Think about it. He's a king. It seems like it would be the scariest thing to say that I'm not sure. Usually people in a position of power never show fear. Some of us learn to live this way. We're afraid of nothing. You know what I love about this story is what the Bible says. The Bible says that then Jehoshaphat, when he heard the news and the pressure was on and the king of the whole nation hears, here's what it says. I'm not sure how he manifested it, how he showed it, but everybody, to everybody it was clear. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid. You know what I felt the Holy Spirit put on my heart to tell you? That it's okay not to be okay. It's okay not to be okay. It's okay to sometimes be afraid. The problem is some of us are living this life of lies that we're afraid of nothing. You ever met that person before? I'm afraid of nothing. Nothing scares me. If nothing scares you, then why can you not sleep at night when you think about those situations? If nothing ever scares you in your life, then why are you avoiding addressing situations? Did you know that avoidance is a sign of fear? If you're not afraid of nothing, you're not afraid of losing nothing, you're not afraid of losing no job, no nothing, then why can't you not sleep at night? Then why does your heart rate increase whenever you think about it? Why do you have problems breathing? You know what it is? It's a sign of fear. But here's what you have to understand about fear. Fear is not necessarily a sign of weakness. It's just a reality that happens when you experience and you're faced with something that is bigger than you. And here is the reality that you need to understand today. Whatever you don't acknowledge that you feel, you don't give Jesus permission to heal. That's the reality. Whatever you don't acknowledge in your life that you feel, you don't give Jesus permission to heal. Why? Because the Satan, he operates in the dark. He operates in the dark. That is where he has power to operate. And some of us are not overcoming what we need to overcome because you never brought nothing to the feet of Jesus. You know how you're going to have a phenomenal year next year is if you learn this one thing, bring it to the feet of Jesus. Bring it to the feet of Jesus. You know what Psalmist says? He says, for it is you who light my lamp. The Lord my God lightens my darkness. Whatever you bring into the light of Christ, whatever you bring that is nasty, dirty, he lights it up. Because the blood of Jesus washes all things. You know his name is Emmanuel. God with us. God with us. But here's... What we have to understand, what you do with what you face is what matters more than what you initially feel. You see, the reality of life is as you live this life, you will, fear, you will feel fear, but you cannot dwell in fear. 
You may feel uncertainty, but you cannot dwell in uncertainty. There are moments in your life where you may feel confused, but you cannot dwell in confusion. That's where the devil wants you to stay, but that is not how you overcome battles. Here's what encourages me is because I don't know if some of us are like that. Maybe some of you are like that. We're always trying to come up with our own solutions. We always try to hold it in our own little feeble hands. And that's what I think is that's why we have such a weak Christianity because we have so many weak people, weak Christians trying to hold our lives in our own hands instead of giving them into the hands of God. And here's what Jehoshaphat did is he gave you and I a secret on how to get through every single battle that you might be facing in the next year. How to get through every single circumstance. Here's what he says. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. There comes moments where you will not know how and you will not know when and you will not know why. But as long as you know the who that's got your future, you will be all right. Somebody need to say amen. You will be all right. So this morning, I want to give you some keys to a powerful prayer that you find in this scripture. Watch what happens. The Bible says, so Jehoshaphat was afraid, but he set his face to seek the Lord. And so he proclaims the fast throughout all of the Judah and people come. Verse 5 and on says that Jehoshaphat stood before all of the people in the assembly in the house of the Lord before the new court. And watch what he says when he begins to pray. You have to notice this. O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Come on, you missed a good place to say amen. Here's the first key to a powerful prayer is recognizing that someone has your back. Uh, what would you do? What would your next year look like if with 100% certainty you knew that God has gotten your back? What decisions would you have made? What ways would you actually step out in your life if you knew that God has gotten your back? You see, Jehoshaphat, he went into prayer with the mentality of saying that there is power and might in your hand. And because there's, they are in your hand, there's no weapon formed against you that shall prosper, my God. There's nothing that can stand against you and be victorious. I love this because ultimately what he's saying is what can deliver you and I and give us freedom that we desire to have. You know what he says? You're the man. I'm not the man. You're the man, I'm not the man. You're our God, I'm not the God. You're the Savior, I'm not my Savior. The problem with us is we will look to everybody else for help but God. That's the, that's the problem that I want to address this year, the last Sunday. Stop looking to everybody else for help. Because the, 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 what you will find out is that there are moments where the bank's not going to be able to help you. Your cousin will help you, your wife won't help you, your husband won't help you, your finances won't help you, your savings won't help you, your houses, your businesses, they will not help you. There comes a moment where God will allow certain situations in your life where, where when He delivers you, you will know that only God could have done that. God will allow certain situations in your life where you will finally look to Him. And I know there's some of us that have been in some situations this year where if it wasn't for the Lord, we would not have been here. If it wasn't for God, only God could have done this. Only God could have brought me out. Only God could have split the sea. Have you had moments like that this year? Only God could have answered that prayer. Only God could have covered that bill. Only God was able to do that. Because the problem is, the moment you stop praising, here's the reality. You might, just might, find yourself along the side of our brother Nebuchadnezzar are eating grass when we fail to give him the glory when we fail to give him the praise when we begin to think that no it was all me so here's what you realize here's the powerful pattern to prayer when you go to God start out by recognizing that it's the his power and not your own it's his 
power. You see, the problem with us is when we go to prayer, what I find myself do very often, I'll be very vulnerable today, is I will talk about everything else but God's power. Here's what I felt in the spirit. Some of us, we don't even want to pray. We don't like praying. You know why we don't like praying? Because we get more depressed in praying than we're without praying. You ever had a moment in your life when you're like, man, I'm going to bring it to the Lord. And you made this good decision and you got on your knees and you begin to pray. And man, you start praying about this trouble and you start praying about this job. And all of a sudden you get more depressed because what you have done is you have been tricked by the lie of your own head, of your imagination, of Satan himself. You got into the lie. What you did is you were not praying. You were magnifying. You were worshiping your problem and not worshiping your God. God. This is what you did. You spent 15 minutes to talking about your trouble and never remembered about who is the trouble, Savior, Deliverer, my God. His name is Jesus Christ. This is what we do. You talk about everything you're going through and not about who's going with you. That's the problem. That's why some of us get discouraged in prayer because we talk about everything we're going through and never about who's going through it with us. Listen, your prayer life will radically change when the first thing you do is to allocate the power to the one who actually has it. Your prayer life will change absolutely when the first thing you do is magnify the Lord. That's why you find out through the prayer of Jehoshaphat. What did he do? Jehoshaphat didn't do what always we try to do. He did not tell God about everything that he's going through. He began his prayer telling God about everything that God is. That's what's going to absolutely change your life. He's just doing what Grandpa David was doing. You remember that story? The whole hell is breaking loose. David has lost everything in a moment. David is on a raid and he comes back to his own city and his wife's not there. His children are not there. His possessions are not there. People that he loved and people that he brought out, those that were broken, disgusted and busted, he brought them out. And now they're wanting to cast him down. They, now they want to kill him. And what does David do? You remember, he encouraged himself. In what? In the Lord. What David did is he encouraged himself in the Lord. You know what David could have done? Believe me, he could have. He could have still encouraged himself in himself. He could have encouraged himself in his finances. He could have encouraged himself in his possessions. He could have encouraged himself in his army. But what David did is he encouraged himself in the Lord. What does that mean? He encouraged himself in the fact that God still has all the power and ability, not me. That's why he went and overcame. Jehoshaphat just encouraged himself in the Lord. You know what we sometimes do is we do what Samson does. There's a moment with Samson and Delilah in that very famous story in Judges chapter 16 when all of a sudden Delilah turns to Samson for the third time. And what does she ask him? She says, what is the source of your strength? Where does your power come from? And he does something unbelievable. He, what he does is remember what he tells her. The source of my power is in my hair. It absolutely shocks me because nowhere in the Bible you and I find where God turns to Samson and says to him, do not cut your, cut your hair because the power is in your hair. Angel didn't tell him. His mother didn't tell him. What are you saying? What do you mean the power is in your hair? You know, he realized where the power was really at the end of his life. Remember, the Bible says that at the end of his life, he, uh, his hair began to grow out. So he already had the hair that he previously had. But when he goes between the columns, I hope some of you know this story. If you don't, do a little Bible study at home. When he comes between the columns, what does he do? He actually asks God to give him the strength because he finally finds out that my power is not really in my hair. The power is in the name of the Lord. When he comes over me, the Spirit of God comes over me. That is the source of my power. 
That is the source of my comfort. Here's where the revelation lies. Are you ready to hear it? Listen what happens. If he had properly identified the source of his power, there is nothing that Delilah could have taken. If he had finally realized what the source of his satisfaction, his power, his ability lies, then there's nothing that Delilah could have really cut. The problem with you and I is we put our source of our comfort into our jobs, into our homes, into our savings, into our finances. And watch out. You never want to put your source into something that people can take, people can crush, where moth and rust come and destroy. Listen, if he had told Delilah the source of my power is in the name of the Lord he would have had his eyes he would have had his position when you put your source into something people cannot touch you got it right you got it right what Jehoshaphat is actually doing is he's allocating the power to the one who actually has it and when you allocate it to the one who actually has it he begins to actually show it and so what happens here is you find out that Jehoshaphat, not only did he recognize God's hand, watch what he does in verse 7. Verse 7, did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? Did you see what he just did there? He not only recognized the hand of God, he actually remembers God's history. What Jehoshaphat is doing, he's actually reminding himself of what God has already done. What God has already done. Sometimes we listen too much to the voice of the enemy which gets us discouraged because what he does, he always magnifies where I am right now and screaming into my ear that I will be here forever. That's what he does. He wants me to be so afraid of my present that I will believe that this will be my future forever. But here's the word for you this morning. Stop thinking about the drama of the present and focus on the power of the past. Stop thinking about the drama of what's going on right now and remember the power from your past. I don't know all the details about your life, but I do know there's some healings to look to. I do know there's some testimonies that you can pinpoint to. I do know there's some deliverances that happened this year. I do know there's some prayers that God has been answering into your life this year that you can pinpoint to and say, if my God did it, then he will do it again. I do know, but maybe you're sitting here clueless and you're like, Paul, I just, I'm not sure what I could point to. Maybe you're one of those people that are sitting here and you, we, we have that propensity in our life to literally forget everything that God has done. <laughs> forget everything in the ways that he has provided. He has provided mightily for us. The next day we just forget about it. We have that propensity. Maybe you're sitting here. I don't remember any answered prayers. I don't remember any healings. I don't remember any testimonies. I don't remember what God has done. Listen, when you forget all of these things, there's one thing that you cannot forget that God has done for you and I. Something that you can look back to. Something that you can point every voice in your head. Every voice of the enemy. You know what you can always point back to? That God so loved the world. That he has given his one and only son. For you and I not to perish but have everlasting life. There comes a moment where your family is crying on your shoulder. And you don't know what to do. And how to cover the next bill. You're about to lose your house. Listen, don't forget this one thing. Get on your knees before your family. When your kids are looking up to you and say, if God. God has given us his son wouldn't he give us everything else if he has given me his one and only son wouldn't he lead me not just to it but through it that's what happens in prayer you adopt a mindset a different perspective that God wants you to have in your life that when you begin to pray you see before prayer it always feels like I got to it when you get into prayer you understand that God will lead me through it that's a different mindset you see when you think about when I'm just Satan screaming and he say, always says that listen God has just gotten you to it when you think about it like that then when you say I'm just got to it when you always get into something, then that is your final destination. 
that is the final chapter of your life. The page will never be flipped over. But when you, in prayer, begin to adopt the mindset of God that He will lead me through it, then what you do is you begin to see yourself on the other side of whatever may come your way right now. You begin to see yourself on the other side. If he had brought Moses out of Egypt, if he had brought Israel out of the wilderness, if he had brought Peter out of prison, Paul out of the storm, he had brought Lazarus out of the grave, he has brought Jesus out of death, he will bring me out too because that's what God does. He's a deliverer of those who shall seek him with all of their hearts. That's who he is. He's a deliverer. And what you do when you go to prayer like that to God is you begin to recognize the end of God. You begin to remember his history and ultimately what you're doing is you're building your faith. You're building your faith and it is vital. Why? Because the Bible says that he that comes to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of God. You want to have wild faith next year? You want to have fearless faith next year? Listen, here's the problem. You never meet, for the most part, never met. I've never met a Muslim who doesn't know his own scripture. I always meet Christians who never read it. How are there Muslims and Buddhists to study, to read, to commit? Listen, you and I have to be the people of the Word of God. Because the moment you start reading the Word of God, faith begins to arise in you that says, He will lead me through anything that I might face in my life. There's more intimacy with Him. There's more goodness in Him. There's more love to experience. How? When you begin to read the Word of the living God. Amen. Amen. I hear you in the back. I hear you in the balcony. Somebody believes it. Amen. Come on. This is your year, church. This is your year to read the Word of God. This is your year when you, listen, if God is so good to us that He provides physical food on your tables, wouldn't He be so good when you open His Word? He will provide to you the choicest of His revelation. You see, every sermon you've ever heard is milk. It's milk. There's not a sermon that you ever heard in your life that is not milk. It's all milk. You want meat? You got to go and chew it yourself. And the moment you begin to chew it yourself, God begins to speak to you. And when you get a revelation from God himself, there's not a devil in hell, not a family member that could ever stop you because God has spoken to you. Come on, my people, next year, 365 days in the Word of God, and we will finish it together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You're building your faith. I'm just here. All I want to do here this morning is I just want to convince you this next year for you to live a life of prayer. Life of, live a life of prayer. You will make my calling way easier. Way less conflicts, way less marriages that have problems, way less kids leaving the church, way less addictions. Why? Because you have become a person that understands that in Jesus, what did I say last week? What is that present that God has gifted you? In Jesus, you have acceptance. The people are not the only people. No, no, no. How would I say this? Now I just, the reason I just stopped talking is because I'm like, okay, I waited too long. Probably lost you all. You're still here with me? <laughs> the people that come up on the stage are not the only people that hear the word of God. You could hear the word of God. You could read the Word of God. In Jesus, we all have the same acceptance to the throne of grace. And you know what your children need? Is that they might not always had a mama that had a plan, but as long as they know my mama had a friend. <laughs> Your daddy might not always had a plan, but as long as your children know that your daddy had a friend and his name was Jesus, they will be all right. They might see, they might not have a parent who was always present, but as long as they have a parent who was in a presence, they will be all right. That's what I want for our children. Listen, it's not enough for us to just show them theory, show them the reality. You know what kids don't leave a church? It's not the kids that have been exposed to religion. Those leave the church by, by dozens. You know, kids that don't leave the church are the kids that have seen answered prayers in their own household. And I believe this is your ear to have answered prayer. When you bow down before the king, he will step in and fight the battles that you and I could never fight. Amen. I believe that for you. 
I will be closing here very soon. Here's what he did in verse chapter nine, uh, verse nine, chapter twenty. He says, "If disaster comes upon us, if the sword, the judgment, the pestilence, the famine, we will stand." Before this house and before you, for your name is in this house and cry out to you in our affliction. And here's the most important part, for you will hear and save. I'm not sure the kind of year you had, it probably was some ups and some downs. It might have been some highs and I wish it was lows, but sometimes it's low lows. It's times where it's hard to believe. It's times where you have... Messed up as a father, messed up as a dad, messed up, messed up as a husband, messed up as a son, messed up as a Christian. There are moments like that. And the Satan's always on the clock with the voices in your head that tells you you'll be here forever. You done messed up. You'll never come out of this. This is nobody could help you. You've done this to yourself. You've made this decision yourself. This is all that he could do. What does he do? He always points you to yourself. Because if he can just point you to yourself, then he knows you are doomed. Your blood has no power. It's his blood. And so all of a sudden, a spirit of the Lord rushes upon a young man. I haven't read this part yet. Rushes upon a young man as they were doing prayer. And here is what the young man says from this, by the spirit of the Lord. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde. For the battle is not yours but God's verse 15 says you will not need to fight in this battle stand firm hold your position could you say that with me hold your position and see the salvation of the Lord this is good news church he has given you a position an ability to come into the presence of the Most High God even after you messed up. Why? Because your God didn't put you up for adoption the moment you did a mistake. He didn't leave you. No, for, He doesn't do that. He has written your name on the palms of His head. You are the apple of His eye. He has paid the price for you and I. Hold your position. Your position is not based on your righteousness, church. Your position is based on His. Your position is not based on your faithfulness. Your position is based on His. That's good news that you can come into the presence of the Lord and speak with Him face to face. But do it like this. First and foremost, recognize God's hand. Recognize that it's God who holds the universe. Magnify His name. Ma Every time you come into the presence of the Lord, Starting today, starting tomorrow, magnify the Lord. Do not let yourself, your voices in your head, magnify nothing but the Lord God Almighty. Then what I want you to do is remember God's history. Remember what He has already done. Why would you do that? You see, you, it doesn't matter what I have done yesterday. I'm unpredictable. I'm like the Washington weather. I could do whatever, I, whatever. All of a sudden, I'm a different person. I float in, you know, I could float, I could swim, I could do whatever. Tomorrow you might not ever find me. But God, why do we say remember God's history? Why? Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. I change, you change, people change. He doesn't change. And so what you read on the pages of this book, he has the ability to do in your life. Start believing for more. Start believing for more. For each and every one of us, there's a plan that is Ephesians 3.20. Ability of God to do above and beyond your imagination. It's so good, you and I can't imagine it. It's not only in pastor's life, evangelist's life. It's in your business. It's in your family. It's above and beyond your imagination. Why? Because you have the position and you are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Same God resides in you. And so He deserves to do above and beyond in your life. But you know who never is going to see the fulfilled plan of God in their lives? Are the people that are not going to do what Jehoshaphat does next. 
And I'll tell you that next week. No, I'm kidding. I'll tell you that right now. Sign up for part two. So be a member for part two. <laughs> Here's what Jehoshaphat did that was vital. O oh, our God, in verse 12 he says, will you not execute judgment on them for we are powerless. Say it with me, powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. God requires of you two things. It's faith and it's humility. Humility is the ability to say that I'm powerless. And when I say I'm powerless, he becomes powerful in my life. See, he's always powerful. He does not change. But if you want him to be powerful in your life, you need to acknowledge your powerlessness. That's what he does. That's what Jehoshaphat did. He says, listen, God, we are powerless. And all of a sudden, God says, good, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. You will overcome. You will win. I'm coming. Because I will share my glory with nobody and nothing else. He gets the glory. You see, God elevates those that are humble. But what does he do with the prideful? What's the verse? He opposes the proud, but exalts the humble. I believe this is our year, church, to come humbly before the Lord and watch what only he could do in our lives as we become woman, man, children of prayer in Jesus mighty name would you stand with me in the presence of the Lord believing for more believing for more believing for more believing for depth depth in him depth with him depth comes from your communion with him listen I cannot talk to the Lord for you you have to talk to him for yourself but when you do I believe that you will see a victory this is your year, church, a year of victory for you and your family. 2024, the best year of our lives in Jesus' mighty name. 